to Buzzcocks in their own words. I'm Colleen Murphy from Classic Album Sundays. Uh, just a few things about tonight. If you do need to leave the room for any reason, use these doors because those doors will get you nowhere. So use that door back there or this door. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight with the Buzzcocks and um, Q&A a, a bit later after I have my conversation. I get to ask the questions first. And then after that, they'll be doing a signing outside uh, in the foyer, and there'll be drinks served as well. The bar will be open. But a lot of people have been asking me when I told them that I was doing this event here, they said, why are they celebrating punk at the British Library? That certainly seems very unpunk. And of course, you know, this question of what is punk has kind of accompanied punk since the very beginning. And I'm not even going to try to attempt to qualify what punk actually is. It's a question I've been asking myself ever since I bought the Sex Pistols debut album with my mom at the mall as a very young teenager in a very small New England town. Uh, again, as an adult, I believe there are many definitions that have merit and often contradict. But I wanted to explain why I feel punk London is important and also punk Manchester. Part of the answer is because our cultural institutions are increasingly discovering and implementing ways in which they can be relevant and how they can talk to the people here today. But the real reason has to do with punk itself. Subcultures spawn movements in fashion, literature, film, photography, art, design, television, along with changes in political and social attitudes, speech patterns, language patterns, and even humor. And these subcultures eventually become watered down, yet they still manage to exert an influence on what is later deemed socially acceptable, and they become part of the framework of our everyday lives and part of mainstream popular culture. Music is at the access of, near, access of nearly every significant subculture, rock and roll, uh, when the Ted, ska and the mods, the psychedelic movement and flower power and the hippies, Art and glam rock, heavy metal, uh, heavy rock, roots reggae, hip hop, acid house, jungle, grime, and of course, punk. And these are much more than just musical disciplines as they're able to inspire all these other uh, kinds of things, other disciplines aside from music. But I often wonder, is it the music that actually triggers these cultural explosions or is the, mu the music a vehicle that acts as one of humans' earliest detectors and reflectors of our ever-changing condition? Is music the way in which humans and youths in particular subconsciously first manifest a transformation? So what came first? That's a question we may answer tonight. We may not answer tonight, but hopefully we'll shed some light onto it as we celebrate a moment when there was a seismic shift in attitude and culture. And I feel this is a question that our cultural institutions must endeavor to address, whether it's the British Library, the ICA, the VNA, Somerset House. These establishments need to not only remain relevant, but must recognize and address these cultural milestones. And that's why we're discussing punk at the British Library today. And tonight, we'll try to revisit the spirit of punk in Manchester during 1976, 77, 78 with my special guests, Steve Diggle and Pete Shelley from the Buzzcocks and their ex-manager and good friend, Richard Boone. So please give them a hand. Now we're arguing Actually, about it's where it's to it's sit because <laughs> I'm damaged in this ear, probably from listening to all that rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. How thank are you? You're welcome. You all right? Yes. Yep. Great. You ready to talk about, uh, you ready to rewind 40 years? Um, it's not so much rewind. <laughs> it's a bit I think they remember more about it than we do. Right? <laughs> it's a shared thing. It's, you know, we've got to put these jigsaw pieces back together. Well, the, between the three of you, I think you'll be able to do that, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, good. Very good. Well, I just want to kind of go back to 1976 before you were even playing together as a band. And just to kind of get an idea of what Manchester was like in early <clears throat> 1976 and the mid-70s in general. It was grim. 
grim. Hey, it was beautifully grim. Lovely old pubs on every corner, you know, mm -hmm. smelling of cigarettes and beer and stuff. <laughs> Nobody had any money. It was black and white, you know. I thought it was black and white because I had a Joy Division poster over yeah. my bed growing up, and that was in black and white, and I was sure that Manchester was black and well, white. Well, yeah. It was a bit like the original opening sequence for Coronation Street. <laughs> <laughs> black so and white. But, yeah. but looking back, it was amazing. It was very inspiring because you'd be in your room with a light bulb, and that started to make you think, you know. There mm -hmm. was nothing else to do, you know. Yeah, nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not from Manchester, he wouldn't know, but... You're from <laughs> I moved to Manchester in 1976 and did the music listings for a fortnightly uh, listing magazine. Mm -hmm. And, like, it was really thin. <laughs> because, and that's why, because nothing was happening. Mm. Nothing was happening. There was lots of pub gigs. Mm -hmm. uh, pub rock. Yeah. <laughs> Where people had played the like, covers of the rock. Mm -hmm. But as far as there being anything, the thing, well, I mean, at first me and Howard didn't, I mean, when we got the Sex Pistols, well, we should really ask about it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the thing which always surprised me looking back was that well, the fact is we didn't know anybody. <coughs> we didn't have friends who were in bands. We were just doing it completely in isolation. Mm -hmm. and thought nobody on earth would be interested in what we're doing. Right. So, did, did it feel like there were any opportunities presenting themselves to you, or did it feel pretty dire at that time? Uh, well, it was very dire. That's what mm -hmm. we did it ourselves. Yeah. There was no alternative. Because, I mean, we didn't know somebody who could say, oh, yeah, I'll put you on. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you meet Howard? Um, well, I, met, I was at the same college as him, Bolton Institute of Technology. And what were you studying there? I was doing uh, electronics, but then I packed that in. <coughs> and did uh, <coughs> comparative European literature and uh, philosophy. <laughs> Very erudite. <laughs> and what were you doing in early 1976? Happily on the dole, you know, mm -hmm. wandering the streets, observing things. But I used to go to the library a lot, you know. <laughs> a bit like this place. Actually. Right. So just so feel... A bit of a self-taught man, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I did my O levels and A levels, but I was going to go to university, but you know, I met these instead. You know? <laughs> and I was glad. I didn't want to be a sociologist, really. You know? Right. So, um, so I was figuring myself out in the wilderness, you know, which which was which was lovely, really, walking around, observing people, and having all that free time when you're young. Because mm. a lot of those punks <clears throat> were on the dole at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and if you use it right, you need that space. I think you know that freedom. And that's self-realization. And that's what the dole in a positive way can do for you. Absolutely. The desperation and all the rest of it soon makes you start to think, you know. I mean, it's and that's what was beautiful about him. Because yeah, well, at school, it's the jug and pour it. system. They give you a lot of information, pour it in. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily saying you use the intelligence of it, you know. Absolutely. Whereas when you're walking around on the streets, you know, you start to see things real, you know. From my side of it, you know. Right. And what kind of music were you guys listening to? Um, well, well um, <coughs> myself and Howard, we were listening to, well, separately, but then we found we had a, a mutual interest. Mm -hmm. uh, things like Velvet Underground, mm -hmm. um, The Stooges, um, Cam. 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 <laughs> I mean, a lot of uh, the no. German. Yeah, no. mm -hmm. I mean, things which, but really, when you put on, you could clear a room. <laughs> I tried to clear this room earlier. I put, I put Sister Ray on as they were walking in, but they decided to stay. Ah, yeah, Sorry well, about that. It's different now. <laughs> it's different now. But in those days, yeah. it, it was a whole different country. Mm -hmm. Because but when you... I, I mean, you, it was music which nobody liked at all. Yeah. Everybody was into sort of like heavy metal, but it wasn't as widdly with you know, I mean, things like... Uh, Black Sabbath and Deep Purple. And mm -hmm. th there was a lot of blues and, and it was all to do with how how many notes you could fit into your 20 minute guitar solo. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like the things which were, were more on the noisy side, um, but, but were funny yeah. as well. Um, so, I mean, that's basically what we tried to do. And, 
the, the one we were doing. I mean, in fact, in fact we were making the most uncommercial form of music we, we thought possible. <laughs> I mean, we even had swearing. <laughs> I mean, nobody did that. I mean, exactly. Like John Lennon swore a couple of times in this later in his sort of career. Album. Yeah. But, uh, that, yeah. But that was it. I mean, you just didn't swear. On it. And how about you, Steve? What were you listening to? Um, well, all the classic stuff. I remember, like, listening to Little Richard, and Little Richard live sound amazing. You know, very live, very. And um, yeah, you know, I just grew up in that rock and roll. Ear of all that kind of Amazing. stuff. Um, <laughs> well, you haven't shaken it off yet. Huh? <laughs> no, I'm not going to shake it off for you. <laughs> nobody else. Um, what, 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 what happened was, my mum brought me Swift and Shout off the market. The Beatles had just come out. I had mm -hmm. the Little Richard records, and I went across the road to my mate's house, and there was this. Uh, his sister was 16. She had lovely long blonde hair. And um, she had the first Bob Dylan album and the first Beatles album. And I didn't realise my life would be crystallised in that moment, watching her dry her hair with a hairdryer, which I'd never seen in my life. We used to dry them with a towel. <laughs> the Russians had landed a Sputnik on the moon a couple of years ago, and I thought it was that. Mm. So I had that lovely imagery there, you know. Mm. And um, there was also a Spanish guitar in the corner. And um, looking at her dry her hair, I plucked a string, and that was like my first sexual experience. You know. <laughs> I didn't know I was having a heart attack at the age of seven or it was doing something else to me. I'm not sure what it was, but there was something going on. Because that's the sexuality side of music as yes, well, you know. Absolutely. I, I was getting the boat, but I didn't realise at the time. Mm -hmm. But from that moment, that room, you know, that obviously changed my life to what I do, you know. Stop that. Do you think you can fix that? <laughs> fix it. Somebody's trying to speak, isn't it? <laughs> Fix it. It's still not over not being electronic. <laughs> I was just going to say, you should be able to do that. You can build an oscillator, <laughs> right? <laughs> you did build an oscillator, didn't you? Yeah. And how did, so how did he become, uh, you started to make music with Tavoto? Tell me that story. Tell us that story of how you wanted to well, be together. He put up a notice on the, the college notice board saying, wanted. Uh, by musicians to do a version of Sister Ray. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think it's Pete. <laughs> Someone's mic's not working. That used to happen back really? in the day. <laughs> I was going to say, it's real punk now. It? Nothing works in those days. It's nothing strange in that way. It's always a nostalgic trip to all that. And that's yeah. exactly <laughs> what it is. <laughs> One, two, one, two. Is it working? I think it's working, yeah. Hopefully we won't hear any more weird sounds. Yeah. So um, you and so Howard. Yes, so um, I phoned him up because I'd seen him around college. Mm -hmm. So I knew him vaguely to not to. Um, and then we started the meeting on, on Wednesday afternoons because we, we had that free at college. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to go into this bloke's house. But when his dad wasn't on night shifts, um, and we used to play songs and things. And then he used to go around to his house and, used to, and we used to start writing songs. I'm thinking, um, uh, and one of the first ones I remember doing was Time's Up. Mm -hmm. And what was it like, the two of you, it was just the two of you, were you recording demos or just writing these no, songs? No, 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 just, just writing. Just writing. And what gave you the idea to bring the Sex Pistols up to Manchester? Well, there's, in February, there was a, uh, there was one day we were in the, in the, in the coffee bar and Howard had bought a copy of, uh, of The Enemy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Neil Spencer's review ruined our lives. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I was looking... Well, Howard remembers me looking through it. Um, I don't, don't... I thought he would look through it. But anyway, saw this review. And it said they did a Stooges song. <laughs> now, if they'd have said they did a... Um, a Faces song. Is it all oh, small faces? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, it was so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if, one with a big if, face, if, one with if, if it had said that... <laughs> if it had said they did a... Then uh, they flipped over and, and carried on going. But because it said a Stooges song, we thought, there's another band who likes Stooges. Because you did you feel quite isolated at that time in your musical tastes? Well, yes, because, I mean, by then, most of the people who... who who phoned Howard about the original ad 
had, <laughs> had gone away, really. It was <laughs> based in just me and Howard writing these weird songs. Mm -hmm. And so they need to bring this, the pistols up to Manchester. Well, yeah, so I mean, to well, this most legendary gig. <laughs> the thing, like you do, um, uh, uh, that evening we drove down to, <laughs> to stop at Richard's. This was our great lost weekend <laughs> in February. <laughs> Howard and Peter came down and stayed with me. I was an art student in Reading, and we spent the weekend, uh, 20th and 21st, maybe, of February, Peter. Something like that. Something like that. We're all old. <laughs> uh, I think everybody else. High Wickham and Wellington City. Yes. And it was just, just seeing them, and they were kind of our age, and there was this whole, <clears throat> you either got them, which very few people did, or you hated them, which many did. Straight away, you saw them, you got something, and... They were really impressed that people had come from Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, because only 12 people ever turn up and see us. Uh, and it was just inspiring. Why was it so inspiring? What was it about them that was so inspiring? Johnny. How so? Uh, one of the gigs was the Friday Night Student Union. <clears throat> they were opening for... Some, God, it, Screaming Lord Such. Screaming Lord <laughs> Such. So they were doing no fun, and all these lads were who didn't who didn't get it sat down the front. Johnny wandered along the stage and tousled all their hair. <laughs> <laughs> then their mates at the back piled in, the ones who were kind of thinking, yeah, dragged Johnny off stage. Some of the few Pistols fans joined it, and it was like a scrum out of Tom and Jerry. And Johnny kept singing and then crawled out of this melee and got on stage and said, that was no fun. <laughs> <laughs> but we had fun, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> and you were inspired. Well, it, it wasn't as much inspired, but it matched up with what we imagined doing. Because mm. it was... the. The thing, the, the idea was to come up with something which would polarise an audience. It, it, it was because I remember reading about how, um, how Frank Zappa was playing somewhere, and there were people leaving this bar opposite, and he went to try and find out what it was, and it was Alice Cooper playing. Mm -hmm. So. There's a long tradition in punk of, of actually but, but doing your darnest to make sure that the audience but <coughs> feel a bit... Left the, the room. Left the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people walking out, it seems great. We yeah. managed to clear it of, of people who don't, who, who don't get what we're trying to do. But I what? mean, that's why it came as a complete surprise when we became successful. <laughs> <laughs> I think to all of you, yeah. It's a failure, really. But why, why the, uh... <laughs> exactly, you didn't polarise at all. No, but why, why was it important to you to polarise? Why was that so inspiring? Because everything else was very boring. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, it was just incredibly boring. It was really boring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in fact, we wrote a song about it. <laughs> Let's listen to it then.
I've stolen. Stolen from uh, Brian Eno, I think, Peter. Um, no, I, I just remember that we were in that borrowed in, in the rehearsal. Uh, yeah. Appropriated in the basement, and um, I just started playing the two notes, and afterwards we all fell a bit laughing. So that was. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the the main thing because it was against what. Oh, I'll tell you how boring it was, though. I, I, we, do you remember it. Yes and stuff? Yes. I, well, we used to get free tickets and all go into these things. You'd stand outside and six people come out, you'd be ticket. Now, when Rick Wakeman left, his, um, um, <laughs> a guy called Patrick Moraz uh, took his place and did a, a solo gig at the free train. And I thought, what am I doing here? He had a telephone exchange of electronic things all over, making bleeps and noises <laughs> yeah. that nobody could afford, and it was like, you couldn't even relate to it, really, in that way. And then, at the end, he brought an Alpine horn out, because it was Swiss. <laughs> and that's the length of this thing. And it's a long way from, you know, Little Rich and all these people, you know, and the velvet. And the, I thought, something's got to change from there. Did it feel like there was just too much distance between the audience and, and the band? Yeah. It was like just... At least if you look at someone with a guitar, it was a bit inspiring. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind electronics, but it wasn't making any of the right noises. <laughs> when you've got all that wealth of electronic equipment behind you, and then you have to pull out an Alpine horn as well, too. <laughs> it just looked ridiculous, you know. But he didn't look sexy like Elvis, he looked hideous, and it's like, yeah. I think we've lost our way a bit in music. <laughs> and that's why that song had to out and bored him, you know. Let's talk about another point to that song, which by the time of the Anarchy tour, all the early instigators, including us here, so, and the tabloids took over, and it just became cliche after cliche, and bin liner after bin liner, and boredom was one of the kind of adopt this slogan. This is satire mm. on that as much as guitar <laughs> solos. It's the satire it's almost on the, on the movement itself as well. Yeah. It's interesting too because it's it's a sentiment that's kind of stayed for so for decades. I mean, I remember entering Nirvana uh, for Nevermind and. It's the same kind of, you know, spirit. It's the same kind of sentiments that they had so many years later, you know, like 15 years later. Well, well, he was very inspired by that well of all them punk bands, in including us, and we did the last tour, and we did Yeah, yeah. Um, so he got the attitude, which was... It was more the attitude than the music, really, you know, mm -hmm. looking for those other things. Like and saying about, about causing reactions and waking up your consciousness to things, you know. And when you let's just talk about how you guys met as well. Because did you meet at the uh, Lesser Free Trade Hall? Yes. That that no, fortuitous night. Years. Tell us that story. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, we finally got a Six Pistols up, but we yeah. didn't have a band to play. Mm -hmm. So, but apparently, but within earshot of um, a Malcolm McLaren, Howard had said he'd heard that somebody had phoned up a bass player from his house, and so. That was it. <laughs> so I'm just collecting the, the tickets and the money in <clears throat> the, the box office. And there's Malcolm, and he's going out, uh, you know, step right up, you know, like the... the, um, the Show person yeah, he is. Yeah. yeah. And, so um, Barker, yeah, Barker. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> no, it was literally doing that. <laughs> and anybody who was hanging around outside of the free trade, he'd go over, and, and there was like a blackboard outside, wasn't there? Was, Live from London, Sex Pistols. <laughs> um, anyway, he'd arranged to meet somebody outside. Oh, no, she's asked me now. He's telling me my story, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. 40 years, it's okay. not changed. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, <laughs> he walks Malcolm and he goes, here's your new bass player. And I said, oh, well, I'm going to be here for about five minutes. Um, but still collecting the money, but I'll meet, I think I was upstairs in the bar. I was playing with a band, a couple of people near me around my house, and I realised they didn't mean it and couldn't see what, you know, what I was looking at, because I was, I was into who, I knew about the Ab Velvet Underground, had their records or things, but I'm going to make three-minute songs and smash the guitars mm -hmm. and make, you know, that visual input on it, you know. And um, I realised a lot of guys that played the music and these people I was playing with, they didn't mean it or whatever, they just wanted to be entertainers, you know. So I arranged to meet about this guy out of the paper, out of the free trade hall, and they'd phoned somebody else up. And I'm stood there, Malcolm Clarence said, they're in here, and I said, no, I'm waiting for, I'm going to form a band, I'm, you know, I'm waiting for somebody else, I'm not. 
-hmm. And he said, oh, they do substitute. And I thought, well, I mean on that, but he said they're in here, so I didn't realise, you know, and the classic Mark McLaren situation, his thing, followed him in and Pete was collecting tickets on the door. But the person they were supposed to meet and the person I was supposed no, to meet was, was no, still outside. No, the person... <laughs> well, not in your case, but in my case. There was no but I thought you put an ad in Five well. minutes later, but Malcolm did History's come in. History's changing as we... Uh, <laughs> uh, five minutes later, but We'll Malcolm have to do another one. In. He's in ten years' time and get his right. Uh, Malcolm um, did come in and said, here's your new guitarist. Yeah. No, I knew... Yeah, I did, didn't I? I knew that there wasn't a... <laughs> <laughs> so, within about two minutes... Yeah. I'm going, uh, no, no. Yeah, no, I was there, and maybe you don't have to tell me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you walk in the bar. But I thought, why is he, why is he taking me to introduce me to guy, guy tech collecting tickets? And then we I said, we're meeting the bar. <laughs> and we were talking at cross purpose. Some of it made sense, like, you know, about being in a group. I said, well, there's this band, band Sex Pistols, they're about to come on. So you know, by what? fate and, you know, it was chance destiny. and everything. It was destiny. It worked, yeah. And Mal it was Malcolm. Yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> what. That was definitely down to Malcolm. Yeah. Amazing thing, really. It is amazing. I mean, what was he and like thought, as a what was what was he like as a as a person? It was very funny. Yeah. Yep. He was very funny and he had these weird ideas which <laughs> sort of like worked. Some crazy work. art student yeah, that had crazy. been to Paris for a while, you know. And it was lovely, he was very inspiring with it all, you know. Mm. But a little bit dangerous, you thought you don't know where he's going. He didn't <laughs> scare me because I was from Manchester and we had <laughs> Different Could things. Could be scared do. by someone's No, own no, not like that. He was <laughs> a bit arty, you know. I knew about it all as well, but he was like, you know. But Malcolm he enjoyed him for that. Malcolm had a tape loop in the first half of 1976, which he could just download to anyone who was prepared to listen, which was, there was all these young kids, they're bored with this, they're bored with that, they're getting short, they're getting their hair cut. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, and, and, just went on and, and he invented he said, and like there's this band in Birmingham and he just so he, he tried to promote a whole scene going before there was one mm. in fact some, some of our early gigs well I mean in fact but that first six months virtually all our gigs was to do with Malcolm trying to make it look like something was happening <laughs> that's right cause so it... like, we had to look so, or in some ways like run around and make it look like we were a crowd yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, that first gig, was it very uh, was crowded Austrian, with the yeah, Sex he, Pistols? He'd got an Austrian TV. No, there's about 42 people or something. 43. And I don't know whether that... 3,000 people seen. swear they were exactly, there. Exactly, yeah, exactly. That's right. Except <laughs> you read about it, you know... It's I recommend Clinton Haley's book, Anarchy in the Year Zero, who <laughs> actually is... It's like a blow-by-blow -blow account of almost every day in 76 around the Pistols and people who... Started doing stuff, mm -hmm. and it, it's because it was all about doing stuff. Punk was about doing stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, they often say that history is made by people who turn up, and that's how punk started. A lot of people turned well, not a lot, well, but people a few went, that turned up at that gig ended up doing something very special. Yeah, yeah. And six weeks later, you guys were playing with them. <clears throat> yeah. And all of a sudden, you have a band. And Malcolm said, "If you're not on in ten minutes, you're not going on." <laughs> what was that like for you? Well, we went on and we did. We did our performance, um, and then we 20 minutes, uh, smashed, smashed the guitar, and then, and then ran off into the audience. Mm. <laughs> Straight to the bar. <laughs> 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 yeah. You've never been to stage and before, apart well, from school it, reading a poem. It's like, what do you do with it? You know, mm. do you go in the dressing room and be professional, mm -hmm. and leap into the audience, and went, I went straight to the bar. You know? It well, wasn't just for the drink, it was like I didn't know what to do, really. Right. But it was exhilarating for that moment, because you could feel that change coming on with people. And all among some heroes out there that never been written about were, were vital, you know, the audience, the ones that were, were getting it, you know. Mm. They become alive and everything. That's what was amazing, yeah. And there's a lot of people that were between those two gigs. There's a lot of people that then went to start up bands themselves, whether they were starting Warsaw, mm. which became Joy Division, or The Fall, or... Morrissey, I believe, is at one of the gigs as well. Mm, yeah. So you guys played he your part in inspiring the notes, Manchester yeah. scene, really. <laughs> <laughs> you, you played your part in really inspiring the Manchester scene. Well, no, the Manchester scene came out because it looked like something was happening. Mm -hmm. And then people just thought, oh, well, it's OK. Well, well, I'd like to do something like that as well. But something was happening. You know, there was a nightclub called Rafters. There was mm. the band on the wall that was a jazz club and used to go there 
pre-pump, they'd be playing nines and sevens and going, you know, I'm clever and that. And then you guys, you three chord wonders and all this. But when we played there, there was people standing on their chairs and queuing around the corner. And that was a great moment for me. I thought, you know, I respected those jazz people. It was only open till late, two o'clock. And you thought, but they felt a little bit superior. You know? mm. But when we went there, it made it exciting. You know? But there was a point. That's there was there was a point to actually building a community of like-minded people who got it or didn't, and that took some time to to build up, didn't it, Peter? Uh, yeah, well, it, I mean, there are still oceans of boredom. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing. It looks like a lot happened in a short time, but actually being there was like. You know, like watching paint dry. <laughs> <laughs> When's something going to happen? Because we were actually trying to find other musicians to make something happen. What you, how we met Morrissey. Um, there was a guy, Rick Obi, with some phone number. He put a play, an advert in Sounds or Melody Maker. 061 it should have been. That was his phone number. And... Uh, Teenage drummer John Marr worked that out, called him and said, let's have afternoon tea at the Piccadilly Hotel. Did you not come? And he, Rick Obi brought his friend, St Stephen of Stratford. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we can, can, kind of encountered him. But there was a... There was almost, it wasn't quite like saying it was a mission is too deterministic, but there was a thing to find people in Manchester that we could play with. Mm. And uh, when we found some of them, <coughs> whenever Boscoff's got gigs like in that London, we'd always try to bring a Manchester support band like The Fall and The wor The Worst. For God's sake, round of applause for the worst. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, 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 but the and Cooper is, yeah, Clark... I met on the top of a, a bus going home after, after the lunch bar. Uh, I'd seen them there and we were on the same bus. Mm -hmm. So we got talking and they said, oh, yeah, we've got this band. We're called The Fall after Albert Cameron's book. They said we're going to be called The Outsiders, but there's already a band called it. <laughs> <laughs> but we also brought, like... Uh, Alternative poet laureate John Cooper yeah. Clark down yeah. to London when he would be bottled off <laughs> and now he's a national treasure. Mm. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> it seems like there's a real literary bent to a lot of the Manchester acts. Do you agree with that? Um, well, I mean, like, well, I mean, like Steve always said, we're punks with library cards. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody sure. here has a library card, <laughs> being a librarian myself. <laughs> I could never join the library, it was too much responsibility. You know, <laughs> that I love the library, but you can... <laughs> well, but it like... was that element, you know. I think the book element was inspiring in another way, you know. You bought your George Orwells when you were young and all this stuff, and got into all the things, you know. I mean, there was no internet. Was, yeah, to me, that, was, that. that went hand in hand with buying exactly. a single, you know. <laughs> I remember that well. So things the dark happened days. very slowly. It wasn't that you just, mm -hmm. you know, type it something into a search engine and you can find out, mm -hmm. well, what it is it want and then get bored with it. It was like every little nugget of information was, that was precious. And the fact is you'd share that information with people. So the, the, the good thing about the punk bands as well as supporting each other because, you know, so it, it looked like there was a crowd. I mean, like I say, I mean, like, but we got a call to go down and play at the Notre Dame Hall in uh, Lesser Square, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And it was cause, because Malcolm had brought this Austrian film crew to make it look like there was something happening. Right. And so we were there as another punk, you know, as one of these <laughs> punk bands. Extras. Extras. Yeah. Extras. <laughs> yeah. Extras in his, you know, he, he wanted to do the big <laughs> biblical epic about it. How something was happening, <laughs> and we were in the extras, and and that's why we, we came down and did the screen on the green, and we did the hundred club punk festival, and you know the whole list, and, and, and even when uh, uh, the dam had uh, been kicked off the Anarchy tour, we get a call from uh, Mal oh come over to the hotel, um, and it was just after the Bill Gundy thing, and. Um, 
So that's how we played on the on the only guitar. Mm -hmm. Well, let's back up a wee bit. How about to the Spiral Scratch EP itself? Because you know you're saying you're kind of you're you're quite bored. <laughs> things up. aren't happening. Yeah. Like things aren't happening very quickly. But it, you did it yourself. I mean, this yes. really along with the w Saints. With a little bit of encouragement from um, our agent, agent, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> who had this idea that we could get some studio downtime and make a record. Anyway, that fell through. But the idea was then planted that we could make a record. Of course, he wanted to be a producer. But didn't it seem like quite a mysterious thing? I mean, this is the days before internet. Like, how do you put out a record? You <coughs> have this big band no. sort of playing. It must have been really quite daunting yeah. in a way. So how did you figure it out? Research. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the point was, uh, I think, around the time in, when it, after the Anarchy tour, there was a whole sense of it's over, time's running out, it's about to end. Let's make a document. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't let's make a record necessarily. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, well, obviously, you need a studio. And uh, you know, to manufacture, you need some money. So we roped in family and friends. Take that Kickstarter, birth of crowdfunding as well as indie. <laughs> um, and it was like, press a thousand. And we spent a whole kind of weekend checking every one. Everyone. everyone. <laughs> With an uh, boy's lamp. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> Two quality control. Two. Quality control. That's We've become alienated going, putting them in different <laughs> sleeves. We'd have to go uh, to the pub for an hour and come back over. Oh, we'll <laughs> but then... How many more do you sing? Then it got out of hand. So, after, after about the first month, when we were constantly having to rep repress and repress, right. uh, we stopped doing that. So, lots of people may have faulty copies. <laughs> uh, but there was, yeah, it was, it, there was hardly any... <laughs> Infrastructure at the there time fun, for that. I mean, Rough Trade had mail order. Our, our friend John Webster, who's uh, manager at Virgin Records at Lever, Nine Lever Street, when people who managed record stores had autonomy over their purchasing, they don't anymore, uh, he found some of his colleagues across the north, just take, take a box of 25, see what happens. Because there was no way. <coughs> I mean, it kick-started Rough Trade moving from mail order from the shop into organising regional distribution, thing that became known as the cartel. So uh, that was cool. That's really cool. And it must have been really <laughs> amazing to hold your own record that. in your hands. It was borrowed, incredible. Mm. Yeah, when I borrowed my dad's car, me and you went down to that warehouse. Yeah. And you'd seen records in the shop, but you never counted them, you know. But that a thousand records on a pallet, it was like Carl Andre's brick. Do you remember that? <laughs> it looked a work of art. I'd never seen a thousand records mm -hmm. in that way in boxes, and, and that was amazing to me. So, well, I mean, you know, it must have been a really proud moment. It, well, it, well, it was just like, wow, well, that's something. Very Marxist. Pardon? It's very Marxist. Into the, the means of production. It was there next to the washing machines and all the rest of it, you know. <laughs> when you see him, I do it, you don't imagine him doing that. It like, appears in the shop magically. But there was also, you know, well, that's the thing. Very Records good. were a thing that mm. uh, were like these occult things that on weekend of release just arrived in the shop. Mm. Uh, God knows how they got there, uh, especially mm. if it was the doors. Um, mm -hmm. But we found out. And then other people like uh, Desperate Bicycles um, <coughs> go and do it. Uh. They followed up, and then Scritti Politi's first EP went even further and listed who'd printed the labels, who'd printed the sleeves, how much it cost. We just did technical things like first take, one guitar overdub. But it, it kind of moved that whole thing forward. Why don't we listen to some more music? This would yeah, be, uh... please. Forgot about that. <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> Here, let's do that. 
And it's a good job that I got a Polaroid camera for Christmas. Well, there, there was <laughs> a gag <laughs> about the picture. Yes. Tell me a story about the, the picture. Uh, there's the gag about well, the Polaroid. We'll ask you about that in a second, then. Right. Right. Which, also, re which also relates to the gag about boredom becoming a slogan. DIY. Well, you're trying to just want one time. For kicks, but now you find out that it's a habit that sticks and you're on all gas and addicts. You're on all gas and addicts. Sneaking in the back door with dirty magazines. So your mother wants to know what all the stains on your jeans and you're on all gas and addicts. You're on all gas and addicts. Uh huh. But you still keep a beat and you meet to pulp and you're on all gas of addicts. You're on all gas of addicts. You're on Kika Sonova, you're a no chose at pizza. Live on a fucking yourself to death. All gas of addicts. You're on all gas of addicts. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Assistants and bell hops, you found them all here and there. Children of God and the joy strings, international women with nobody here. After we'd done, it was about 16,000 spiral scratches. Yeah, it was enormous. And we'd mm -hmm. spent all the money <laughs> because the Clash had asked us to come and support them on the White Riot Tour. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have any money left. And the next song that we, well, in order to choose the songs for Spiral Scratch, we all wrote down four songs that we wanted. They went into a hat, and the top four was what was on Spiral Scratch. And the other one we that left was Orgasmanic. And I said, right, the next one we'll do is Orgasmanic. But uh, like I said, we'd used all the money up. <coughs> so we couldn't do any more. And because we'd gone around the country and we were getting the record company interest, so we thought, well, the thing is, we really want to do what we want to do. We don't want anybody telling us, oh, you can't do this or you can't do that. And especially as you had already done it yourself, anyways. Yeah. yeah. So when we actually signed with United Artists with Andrew Lauder, it was basically on the thing that we had control over what we did and they wouldn't interfere. And they said, yeah, we're fine with that. So we, they said, right, what do you want to do as your first single? And we said, oh, get us a money. <laughs> <laughs> you won't get any airplay on that. They just start to like, sink down into that the was the one, that was a, We had the, the four songs, and the fifth one was Orgasm Addict. So that was going to be always going to be the next single. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And how about this artwork from Linda Sterling? She was well, uh, I mean, quite yes. a, a figure in Manchester at the time, wasn't she? Well, but not really. No. I mean, she, was, no. she was just this girl who was hanging around with Hollywood. This on. made her, really. <laughs> okay. This was a starting point, really. Yeah. Well, tell, yeah. us, tell us about Linda. I mean, Connor, she, she, she was at the second Sex Pistols gig yeah. mm -hmm. and fancied Howard. Yeah. That's basically it. <laughs> <laughs> and then she was doing all this work. And then she uh, showed she had a, a, a not Connor, this artistic she's side. Yeah. Uh -huh. that side. Sure. And also put us in touch with Malcolm Garris as well. That's right. There was some party above. Malcolm's here somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Identify yourself. There he is, <laughs> Professor <laughs> Malcolm <laughs> Garrett. <laughs> Bloody hell, uh, you've changed, Martin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> graphic identity oh, yeah. established. We used to call him Professor, and now he is one. But we, <laughs> there was a party at his flat above Cowlishaw's fish, fish shop, <laughs> and uh, Linda introduced me to him, and that's what happened. 
Uh, and at some point, Malcolm and I stayed up all night <coughs> with a Class A drug <laughs> and, uh, use your imaginations, and mapped out the whole, <laughs> a kind of whole design thing. And because we like Linda and she'd done this, she was working on, well, kind of deturning feminist <laughs> icons and... And she's done some posters for us before. Uh, yeah. There were some gigs we'd done. So that's how that happened. And she And there was supposed to be out. no right way up. So this so was... So that one's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Shush. <laughs> no heckling yet. How important was the, the, the visual aspect of punk? Was it... Do you think it was on a par well, with the music? I think... But while looking at the... Well, I mean, we decided with Spouse Scratch that we'd have a picture sleeve. But they, uh, but they weren't the norm at the time. Can I finish my gag about the Polaroid? Oh, yeah. yeah. Which was... <laughs> the Polaroid was a gag on that whole... <coughs> boredom was that gag. DIY was becoming a thing before we... Did, uh, of course, a Polaroid... It's cute to have it as a Polaroid, but it still goes through the same stages of mechanical reproduction as any other image when it comes to printing. Sorry, I'm being technically boring, but I was a production manager for a while. Uh, go on. Go on. Hmm? So go we only had two Polaroids. Have you told them now? There was two pieces of paper Polaroids, weren't it? Yeah, but we only used that one. Yeah. Because you, you look like you're all crammed no, in. No, because the beautiful thing, Howard closed his eyes on the first one, that, and he <laughs> said we got one left. <laughs> which... Which is very in the spirit of punk, which I think is lovely, you know. <laughs> and, and if something had happened on this one, we wouldn't have had a picture on him. But it was but a beautiful that... moment, isn't it? Richard said, we've got one left, you know, yeah. and we'd only use one. You know? But design became Bipolar, very... Bipolar, I'd get one free, you know. So. <laughs> design be was very important. The arguments I had about keeping the group off the cover of the <laughs> sleeves yeah. rather than just graphic identity. I wonder if you're going to play this tune. <laughs> Anyone recognise this shirt and oh. its sleeve? Yep. Yep. Yeah, well, shout out what it is. Robin Hood. <laughs> we will be playing that. We will be playing that. Good. We're going to play a bit later. So that, 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 I mean, this was hand silk screened mm -hmm. by an old, the original one, isn't it? No. an old friend of mine. Uh, and there were, there were elements of trying Which to... Which one was that? Him? Him. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> But there were those I kind of things. Like it, but Chris is bigger. <laughs> <laughs> it would need to be now. Uh, but there was that kind of thing to make the look of the records part of the look of the band, in a way. Because so we had, we had arguments it. about keeping the band off the fucking sleeves. Yes. I so like the band on the sleeves. Why did you want to keep the band off the sleeves? Because it wanted to be art, you know. I think it's a fine <laughs> art between art and what people do in the music and rock and roll. Great rock and roll sleeves had pictures on for me, you know. We all love David Bowie things, all the Bob Dylan things told a story, you know, mm -hmm. of their faces and what they were wearing. And that's very important in rock uh, and roll. We didn't tell it's the important to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> all the kinks, covers and everything, they got pictures on and that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So I was the opposite to what they were doing, but you need opposites to make a third. You know. And I guess you wanted to so call more. So me and Malcolm mystery. and probably Richard on the first album, he wanted to have a cabbage and you know a collage on there. Yeah, it was a salad. Beautiful, <laughs> this beautiful design salad. of his lovely silver sleeve and them, um, and, and and the writing the logo and everything. But I think we stayed up all night. I don't know who's on another substance. <laughs> Well, we came to a compromise, and sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have to work together, you know? mm -hmm. Because you've got to remember, people was identifying as who we are as well and what we're doing, you know? You know? I mean, I'm not, that, you know, the other pitch, you know? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I respect that, I know about art, and, mm -hmm. you know? So sometimes you've got to have that. You know, that's punk rock. You've got to stand up and do your thing with it. And thank God we didn't have the cabbages and the collages. <laughs> <laughs> Although we had them later, which is a lovely thing. Oh, Stephen, because Stephen in the seventies, I'll tell you before about that, the giant carrot. <laughs> yeah, I saw all that. <laughs> yeah, they don't get too close to that carrot, right? <laughs> 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 Why don't I put another song? What but, do um, I get? Because yeah. we were. But it, it's an interesting thing between art and what you're doing as a band, you know. Yes. And that's what I discovered when we were going on that journey. That, and hopefully, somewhere we made a band through it. 
Summer's one sometimes, or is one another yeah. time. Yeah, you got, um, you, you've got the album well, sleeves. I was a punk rocker. I was questioning things <laughs> myself. I'm being told what's going to be on my sleeve half the time, you know. <laughs> I was doing the groundwork, you know, <laughs> sweating my balls off on the stage. Well, yeah. You got the Sorry, folks, but you got the me. album sleeves. Right. Okay. And a key. Come on, you want it? Let's have it. <laughs> types of different factions and groups of people that were in Manchester in the 70s? Because it seemed like there were real, some real battle lines were <coughs> drawn between the punks and the Teds and the, and the group called the Perrys. Can you <coughs> tell us what the atmosphere was like with all these different groups well, of people? The first people that's good. That let, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the first, the first people that's <laughs> not part of the action. Um, the, the first uh, person in a, a nightclub to let punks in in Manchester was a guy called uh, Foo Foo Lamar. He was, mm -hmm. he used to do hen nights and stuff. Drag acts. Um, drag acts. It was like, um, well, Lily, you know, uh, <coughs> Lily's Habits, yeah. really. And what was the name of the club? So, um, Foo Foo's Palace. He had Foo Foo's Palace, and then he used to have a little bar next oh, yeah. door to it. Mm -hmm. and, the, and they're both, like, underground bars. Mm. Um, the good thing with... <coughs> uh, the ranch, which the other little bar attached to, was it was an underage drinking den. <laughs> um, so lots of people used to go there, and because it was run by a drag act, they didn't care for what you were There was no, like, you're not coming in, you were wearing trainers. Which is more accepting. <laughs> But it's also more accepting well, not like just of what you were looked like, David but also... Bowie rooms, or you yeah. had to wear a shirt and tie or whatever. And, everything. Mm -hmm. and like this new thing, this unrecognised thing called punk. I remember being in a bus stop with straight leg jeans, you know, which were flares sewn in because I couldn't afford £80, you know, mm -hmm. um, Vivian Westwood ones. And I used to get my shirts for 30 pence and my brother would rip the corner and write, draw a chimney and a stamp on them. You know. 
mm. and stuff like that. And that was more art than Vivian Westwood to me. That was the Manchester version. A 30 pence shirt, right it, get a pair of shoes, spray them green. Yeah. That was more punk to me, really. More than Michael McLaren, you know, I thought, I've heard what he's had to say, now we're, we're getting in our stride, really. Um, but this Foo Food had let people into this club because nobody else would. But the amazing thing was he'd have his dress on, he'd be doing a, a hen night, and in the other room where the punks were, if they were fighting, he'd, he'd come in, bang their heads together, and throw them out. <laughs> it's the most weirdest thing. You know? <laughs> but it was then, at those early days, you thought, something's happening here, like something magical, mm -hmm. dangerous, it ridiculous, it and it might be called punk. It, it, it was one of our first um, the gigs outside of the Malcolm McLaren. So we had to go and see, but, but I remember me and Howard going to see Foo Foo. He, he also had a... Uh, a sauna massage parlor. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> we know how that goes, yeah. <laughs> um, and he was lying on the table having a, having a massage. Um, mm -hmm. As we tried to sell him this idea that we'd set up on the, the dance floor and, and play this punk music, he let us do it. So but then someone pulled a plug. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Not him, because he was doing his gig next right. door. He'll, he, he's, he's 15 minutes? Yeah, yeah. 15 yeah. Minutes. But that was success, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> there was always that double take, like the guy that picked, kicked the television it, in for the sex pistols. It was stuff. like mission accomplished. You knew you were on the right path, wasn't it, when somebody pulled the plug or did something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you must be doing something right, even though it was negative for that moment. I mean, and you just later not, they just didn't understand it. <laughs> so, uh, that just change. But were there a lot of people in Manchester in general who just didn't understand what you guys were all about? And there was, there was some well, quite violent that. encounters too. Well, no, I mean, like, the, only time, the, the only time I was attacked <coughs> was I was walking through Piccadilly Gardens where one Saturday after going to the ranch bar. And as I was walking along, I was attacked from behind and knocked to the floor uh, by somebody going on about Bob Dylan. <laughs> Probably me, actually. <laughs> No, no, that wasn't no. anything unusual in Piccadilly on 11 o'clock now. <laughs> because this guy thought that, you know, Bob Dylan was better than punks and <laughs> bad mouthing, saying they were all boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but let's move on a little bit with that. Well, it was Manchester started getting an identity with all these little clubs mm -hmm. because of, like, the buzzcocks, really. It was like, we'd seen the buzzcocks and the sex pistols and the ripples, but they all started to came alive, you know? People started to come alive in, in, in the town. And, you know, there was artists, photographers, and all kinds of people. And this electric energy rose from there, you know. And that's what magic, we could see it rising from that black and white stuff we were talking about earlier. So, like, this music's making an impact, but it wasn't just the music, it was the attitude and everything. Suddenly, Manchester had a bit of a scene, you know. And did it feel like a real developed. community? Did it Absolutely. Like you go to rafters every night. Together. You'd meet everybody there on Oxford Road. There's all kinds of people. I went every night and stuff. And, and other night, weird nightclubs that had opened up, you know. Mm -hmm. 17th nightclubs that were run down with them palm trees and bits and pieces. But suddenly they go, they're so desperate on a Tuesday night, they put a punk band on them. Mm -hmm. So out of them dark, squalid places sometimes, there's a lot of beauty in them. You know, you're in the coal mines and you're finding gold, you know, <laughs> gold within your spirit. It was still a very small community. Mm. Pardon? It was still a very small community that was encouraged. And it did, it did take effort to make it grow. Uh, because the thing, one of the things that's, I'm going to quote something you said on television ages ago. On telly, Peter, it was Manchester, we were marsupials. <laughs> We evolved differently. Yeah. The whole music, <laughs> the whole music industry was London centric, probably yeah. largely still is, but we made a point of um, kind of gig exchanges like how penetration from Newcastle played in Manchester, we played in Newcastle. There was an awful lot of that kind of mm. swapping exchange with, program. But, uh, yeah, very good. <laughs> yeah. but it was northern, yeah. which is also why But also in the clubs, when people talk to each other, they're talking about politics and the awareness and who they were and all that. This consciousness coming out, this realisation, like, through punk, they was finding themselves, like you've caught a dozen there, but it was like, 
hold on, I'm this and that. It wasn't like I've just been to be entertained somewhere. And it was this massive vibrant club. And actually, every night, people would be talking to you in a different way, not like, I've seen this band, and I clapped, and that was it. It was like, it's kind of changed my life. Not the music, or not necessarily the propositions we were putting forward, but enough to get them going in some ways, you know. Up in their minds. Inspired, yeah. yeah. And that's what was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And just to move on a little bit, I don't know how quick we want to move this film. Oh, yeah. But when we went to Newcastle, Scotland, and all the rest of it, when we started playing all these other places, we going, before punk, all these towns were dead. Now we've got a little punk club, and now I'm alive, and now there's a community of that. <coughs> so that started happening with really. Liverpool scenes, Scottish scenes, and all that. And that was amazing to see after, because you didn't realise, they was glad to see you, but when he was in a bar with him after or something, you know, mm -hmm. we used to be like, you know, <laughs> have to go through all their problems with them and everything. But <laughs> 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 he came in agony, answered the whole fucking country at one point. <laughs> Sitting up listening, all my girlfriends left me, and right, mainly his fault, right? You know? <laughs> and You're somebody be talking about <laughs> politics, I mean, you know, that as well, you know. But, <laughs> but that was interesting, that brought yeah. us together. And this is touching on that a bit later when, when Boscott's were playing Glasgow Apollo, these four lads turned up backstage and said, If we give you a hand moving the gear in, can you put us on the guest list? And they, yeah, sure. And they hung around orange juice. Yes, yeah, because Edwin Collins did say about the Buzzcocks that you guys were the ones that really changed it for him. I think were you playing with the Clash at, this, at that tour? But he said in any case that it was really, you guys that happened? really inspired well, um, his him. His favorite song and is Boredom, according, yeah. to, <laughs> according to whatever single. What single is that? Very good. <laughs> yeah, someone knows their stuff here, <laughs> unlike us. Well, uh, <laughs> you can start again, everybody. Like knows that. Where have you been, if you like? I right? like my publisher who hasn't sued them yet. <laughs> 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 but I, I saw how like, much you get for two nights. Craftwork yeah. lost their case for like a two-note sample. You're that's a two-note sample, Peter. You're not going to win. No, but it's a long one. <laughs> <laughs> Should we put some more music on? Yeah. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Reality's a dream. A game in which I seem to never find out just what I am. I don't know it. I'm a sham, but if you don't mind Just lying in my bed I think you've got it in for me Is it all in my head? Is it in my head? Can you convince me? When everything I see Just makes me feel You're pulling me down And if it's true This pathetic clown Will keep hanging around That's if you don't mind
styled on the Hershey bar. And uh, <laughs> it is. Isn't it, Prof? No, it's United Arts Corporate. Ah, yeah. <laughs> what do you know? It is the same uh, But this was back in the day about there was all that kind of punk argument. Do you take singles off your album? Mm. And this was advertised as the single off the album. <laughs> and on the, the flip of that is a giant United Artists logo. And uh, <laughs> got the band on top of the pops. And I asked uh, Andrew Lauder, God bless him, great A&R guy, were there any corporate T-shirts so <coughs> the band could wear them? Like T-shirts was a big UA logo. He, he said no, despite the fact that they had them for their sales conference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk about your the topics of what you would write about in your songs. Because it's yes. a lot of times, it seems to me, especially when I was listening to this music, man. you are troubled, yeah. <laughs> and you wear your vulnerabilities on your sleeve. And is that because, a because because punk Because when thing? I wrote the songs, but no, I, I mean, part of the thing with punk was that you, instead of Talk about, but and and what do yes sing about? Sorry, uh, yes. I don't know you got. No, 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 no. no. Uh, but you had to used to have a thing about yes singing. About oh, mushrooms in the sky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with Instead that. Instead of singing about time, that, wrong place. You'd sing about what? <laughs> but was that what you knew about? Because mm -hmm. um, you weren't trying to fool anybody. Because if you're writing stuff where you lay your soul bare, I mean, you're not fooling anybody, are you? No. Except yourself, if, you, if, you, if you're making it up. Of course, it's a, a bit of an artistic license here and there, but, um, you know, in order to make the point. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you'd write about the things which matter to, but to you. And the way that you saw the world, oh, why else do, oh, why do it? There was no... But because we were doing it for ourselves. And it does seem and very personal, days, too, because it's like you're using you as opposed to he, she. It's not like you're standing, telling stories in a third person. It's almost like a direct dialogue, you know, it seemed... Well, yes, well, they usually were direct dialogues. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there were, but there were people, you know, but they know who they were. And mm -hmm. um, But let's talk about a B-side. Someone's phone. Jo when we're all in a meeting. <laughs> Let's talk about the B-side. Joe Strummer loved Autonomy. He said it's a favourite song on the first album. God bless you, Joe. And I was listening to uh, Can, uh, mm -hmm. trying to be an Englishman. Playing, oh, are you going to play it? I will, I will play it. You keep talking about it. Oh, I'll don't worry about it. <laughs> we can't talk about it while you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, keep talking. So you were listening to Can. We're and uh, when I was 20 years old, well, we yeah. all want to see Can, didn't we? The yeah. thing yeah. in Salford and University. <laughs> but um, with the, I got in a weird one place. of the world's greatest drummers, Peter. Wouldn't you agree? And Johnny Marr loves this one, you know, because he made it and all that. But all these people. Um, but I thought I'll pretend to be a German trying to sing English. You know, an English guy <laughs> pretending to be a German singing English. <laughs> I'd, it was a weird place for me. To, you know, you don't wake up every day and do that. But that's how I got to this song, and it fascinated me that. Mm -hmm. And I've still got the tape of it, of that. You know. But also, it's like, you know, anarchy and self-rule and all that kind of stuff. But it's perhaps a more intellectual way. Well, I'm not saying intellectual, really, but... How I mean, did yeah, you come on that word autonomy? But it just sounded lovely, you know. But it was about the self-rule in that way, you know. It's in like other words, you want a love song. The way punk was <laughs> kind of packaged... Um, outside when you're looking outside in yeah. uh, it was like oh yeah it's against Prague and all this but and in fact there was a lot of admiration well, for a lot of different acts that were I, no I grew up with Brian Eno and all these people and the David Bowie low era and all that stuff mm -hmm. and I've got had box sets of Stockhouse and all that you know and I was also recording Hoovers you know when I, mm -hmm. when I was 17 you know my mum you go out for a drink and she'd be hoovering up outside on a Sunday morning I recorded it and played it back I've just got a new solo out with a Hoover on now. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't believe it. I was sending out a story about that. But what I'm saying, we, we, that song on there. Henry. Never mind him. He wasn't even in the band. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but he was lovely. We, we were, needed it. We were all in the band. Yeah. <laughs> you believe what you want. I'm fucking saying. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> he was, he was. He was the ninth member. It was 21st, <laughs> uh, I can't remember. The rest would have been the fucking cover. people running. No, we loved him. We knew him, we went about him. System we um, were saying. But, Let's um, listen to this. <laughs> I'm talking about my art history and what I was fucking doing on there. Don't mess with me. <laughs> we want be a to punk, hear some, man. Give it some. We want to hear. <laughs> They've heard the record. I'm telling you what they the have, background. They haven't yet. The thing was, that and Fiction Old Man Snap, we started to move on the album to sort of avant-garde things a little bit. Mm. And that's what was interesting, you yeah. know. And autonomy was, you know, one of them moving from the linear thing, you know. Mm. He's got to remember, I wrote the song Fast Cars and Promises, the basic thing. He wrote the verse, but the music, I thought it's all linear. Need to get into some experimental stuff now. And our first album, we had that, you know, started to move in that. And that's what was interesting. You know. Now I'll be quiet and okay, listen to him about to fucking let's salesmanship. Let's you know. All right. <laughs> Drummers, yeah. John Marr, who was yeah. who was so melodic, uh, yeah. wasn't he? Well, he, he always used to say that he always used to follow what was being sung. 
<laughs> so he's playing accompaniment to what was being sung. So in his head, but, but, but it's like that joke about the, the, the jazz combo and the playing, that dance combo mm. they're playing. And one says, I fancy a drink. <laughs> I'll try and tell it quick because you can stretch this out. <laughs> stretch this, so, this one out very long. I uh, fancy a drink. So the bass player says, well, I'll go. And said, well, hurry up, because just me and the, the keyboard player. <laughs> so he goes off and he, he's not back in five minutes. And the keyboard player says, I think I should go and try and find out where he is. He says, well, hurry up. The, I'm just playing on my own. <laughs> so he goes, and five minutes later, he's still there and then, still not come back with the drinks. And somebody comes up and says, uh, can you play my way? He says, what the fuck do you think I'm playing? <laughs> <laughs> Very but, with good. John, but with John, you could tell what he was actually playing. John was, yeah. you, you know, if he had chords around chords, you go, this is how the song goes. He goes, I know, and you, you thought, you know, it really, yeah, you know. But it'd be magical. He just it somehow read you, and it was like, away you went. Mm -hmm. And like that lovely intro and that, and the lovely intro and I don't mind, I know what's on with them. They were quite unique to him and great as a drummer, you know. And for a guy that had been playing six weeks and then maybe a few weeks later, that was amazing. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely amazing because he's just like, he said, I didn't go well with a guitar and then I just bought a drum kit. You know? <laughs> and he's kind of one of those guys, you know, he did buy a bicycle later in the, in the <laughs> 80s or something. <laughs> but he was buying entertaining, for, you know, he has to. But he, he was magical. He, he was probably the best punk drummer, really, out of them all, you know. I mean, Topper was great, and Paul Cook and that. It's but John was very good, you know, mm. and very intuitive about it. It's like, he goes like that, and he goes... <laughs> when, well, it's uh, not all about you, you fucking... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, not I'm still talking about John. When you uh, did the Blondie, the uh, European tour supporting Blondie, uh, like, uh, Clem was, was in the audience watching John and vice versa. Yeah, and it was like a double mirror image because he loved him, didn't he? Oh, they are, they? Another great drummer. Well, we're oh, talking yeah. about all Burke. these different kind of musical great drummer in rock band. like, you know, <laughs> pop, rock. You did a, a, an album called Sky Young, which you've recorded. Which can still clear over him. Yeah. What's that? It can still clear over <laughs> <laughs> But did you feel there came a time with punk, which was kind of moving along so <clears throat> fast and furious, that all of a sudden you had to kind of fit into a certain kind of mold and that you maybe couldn't express yourself the way that you wanted to and that you well, wouldn't yeah, well, it, be, well, you it, wouldn't it be punk a little if you were too melodic, you wouldn't while, be you know. punk if you referenced Kraut Rock. came a little stereotype. You had Sid Vicious on the front of the day and when they're shaking a pint of lager with a leather jacket on, which you kind of loved and identified, but also we weren't Sid Vicious. I, you know, I could identify with that thing, but, it, you know, we wasn't that. Mm -hmm. And you start to look, you know, once the punk umbrella of the attitude and the, the explosion of the, you know, the nuclear explosion happened, mm -hmm. everybody had to find themselves as a band. The class became a class, the jam became a jam, the dam became a jam, and the bus got him. It was about the music and other things then, you know. Uh, but because there was a straight so, jacket where the, people tried to think that you were there to entertain them. Mm. I, I never got on well with that. <laughs> 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 Because, I mean, because I wanted them to walk out. I mean, yeah. it didn't really matter to me. I mean, like, during the second album, during the second album tour, <laughs> but, 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 uh, the Love Bites tour, I mean, I mean, I wanted to leave the band because it was just, this was not what I signed up for. <laughs> but what you signed up for may not have well, had any I mean, kind of... Well, no, but the thing I signed up for was the most uncommercial form of music I could think of. Yeah. And when you're... On top of the pops and well, we got to number twelve in the singles chart. Yeah. But I mean, that was. Uh, but the the actual pressure which came from that was <coughs> a bit hard to deal with. Why is that? What kind of pressures were on you? Well, the, the people were expected to be entertained when I, I went on stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as. <laughs> You know, they thought that I owed them something because they'd turned up. <laughs> 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 
when did he start to see? I saw problems with that to, the, to this day. <laughs> but did he start to feel things were changing and kind of spiraling out of control? And yeah. that maybe you wanted to move in a different direction that you weren't so, it had to be so contained or, or entertain or, or did he feel well, it was almost getting too Well, we did lovely songs like Why Can't I Touch? I thought we haven't got a groove song and I started doing that, you know. Mm. I mean, the groove song, you have to get a bit adventurous and musical. We always went off in little lavings. I know we're known for these pop things, which became quite masters at in that popular thing. Mm. But, um, you know, there was the lovely little avenues on the way, which gave you the identity of the Buzzcocks in, in other ways then, you know. And, that, and, and what you realise was, like, half the people of the barricade started disappear, getting married and all this kind of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. There's lovely people here today that still, you know, we're there for the cause, you know, but... Had they been married, yeah. they But, you know, <laughs> you realise, you know, you get them in room 101, they'll squeal, you know what I mean? <laughs> and and that, there was a lot of that as well, you know what I mean? You had the clash and all this, singing around the politics, and you really... And that was a wonderful thing, but but the wheels stay falling <laughs> off the wagon of these things, you know? It, it, it was a similar kind of so anything that Kerry Cobain get... had, was that the people who he was making the music it, in spite of, in order to get back at them, to show them that all the people who thought he was worthless, you know, the jobs, yes, yeah. etc., were the ones who were going, oh, yeah, Nevada, yay, fucking A. You know? mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm sorry, Chris, that's me. Best American. <laughs> <laughs> no, <we're... laughs> oh, that's that's my best American. Someone called Chris in the corner. Put your hand up, someone called Chris in the corner. <laughs> no, uh, but he's American. Time for right? song. <laughs> nah, so he's excusable. <laughs> no, 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 but I'm saying that, that no, but I'm it... just doing my American impression, you know. Yeah. Well, he inspired Kurt, though, that's the thing, and they took it on to this grunge thing, you know. Art feeds off art, you know, from Haydn to Mozart to all the fucking rest of them, Beatles to Jimi Hendrix, it all feeds off each other. Mm -hmm. And then it did extend to the grunge thing, but it's inspired people in a lot of ways. Even by the 80s, it's an amazing way in the bank, and bank managers had spike here. Mm -hmm. Whereas five years earlier, they'd be laughing at you on the streets with that, you know. How do you feel about ridiculous. that? But... Well, it looked ridiculous, but in another way, you think you see how these things ripple, you know. But it's still more in here, you know. It's about that thing. And I think with the Buzzcocks, because we wasn't always... Well, we was on the front page of the enemies and all that for a while. But also, it's that other thing. It's like the secret public. See, you know, there's a, a darker, interesting thing there with it, which I think somehow we've kind of fell into in the way we are, you know. What do you think that is? You what don't is see us falling out of nightclubs like Beyonce or something, right. you know, wherever yeah. else. Yeah. It wasn't a band, it was something internal the and dark in there. Falling out of the fault of you falling out of the ranch. What? <laughs> oh, the yeah. fault of you falling yeah, out of the ranch. Yeah, but that was the ranch. It wasn't uh, <laughs> what's it, uh, Annabelle's, isn't it? <laughs> so is punk more of an attitude rather than like a, a moment in time? Or, For me, or... it was an attitude and belief and like some way of looking at it as saving your life apart from the Bible. Because I've said before, punk's been misinterpreted more than the Bible, as you know. Mm. But it's not a great thing, so really? it's like looking at paint. Everybody sees a painting differently, you know? Even these people on here, you know? And how do you see punk today? Um, <clears throat> I see it as like an inspiration, a spirit. We're older now. When we play now, we still rock, you know? I've got a strength of 10 indie kids, you know? <laughs> an imagination of 30 of them now. <laughs> I'd like to think the bureau's go, you need to get out of the way, we, you know? <laughs> That's what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. But we've, we've got beautiful songs and we've got amazing um, um, dynamics on the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, as people know this always that scene as, well, for me personally, you know, you have to speak for yourself after this, but I... Um, I'll be getting a chance. I, I look... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You'll get it one day. <laughs> I realise, it, yeah, you know, you can't be a 20-year-old with the intent of, like, the punk like that, you know, I'm older now, I'm fucking 61. But 62, I'm interested in what the cows do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in what the crowd are doing and the relationship for that. And that's another development in things, you know. Mm -hmm. And that cuts a lot of that cuts a lot of the thing of the artists and the entertainment. You're still down there with the people right. on, on the streets in the audience. It makes a third there in the magic. Yeah. That's where you see Jesus, the devil, God, and everything else you want to see there. For an hour and a half, yeah. <laughs> That's what live things are about. Yeah. Until the cloners from there, you know. <laughs> they've downloaded this, they've rubbish through. I think that so. next time. I think one of the most important things that came out of punk, and, and still is, and still lives, and should still be adopted, is. Make the place you happen to live in 
<coughs> place you want to be. But also, when Johnny Rotten said, I want them to, there to be more bands like us, he didn't mean the inevitable slavish mimics. He meant bands with that kind of ap attitude. Punk was about opening doors and letting people in. When people started doing that cloning pistol sound, closed doors. Mm -hmm. Peter. How about you? Um, well, for me, for me, I'd say it was about being an active participant in your culture rather than being a passive oh, consumer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good one, yeah. I love that my head's done. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm going to do, I'm going to play one more song, and then I'm going to open it up to a Q&A to all of you, because I'm sure you have some of your own questions. It's oh one of your uh, most oh popular God. songs. <laughs> <laughs> we just been okay. American again, that's right. <laughs> it's how does this thing translate to American, that's interesting. <laughs> How's this thing being live streamed, that's what. So that's the anthem everybody across the world knows. And there's a story about when Buscott's were rehearsing somewhere in Manchester for yet another tour, too much touring, too costly. Um, A&R guy, Tim Chaxfield, came up and they were doing the set and he just said, I haven't heard this before, what is it? And I said, it's the hit. <laughs> and it was. And it also put Marcel Duchamp's fluttering hearts image in the charts. Marcel Duchamp, <laughs> the man who changed art. These people contributed to changing music. And that's all the Greeks writing as well, isn't it? But, <laughs> but has it become... <laughs> a, it's, it's the go-to tune. Is, Is it, it a big... Has it become a millstone round your neck? Do you always feel obliged to deliver that tune? Well... That's a yes or no, Peter. <laughs> the smiles on the 
people hearing us play it that dispel <laughs> any of that, uh, thinking it's a millstone. It is defining, perhaps over defining, but uh, it's just something which resonates with everybody. Got and to the point where they stop leaving. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's what you want if you, you know, to do something. Yeah. If you do something and it touches everybody. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's totally, <laughs> that's totally it. And that is opening the doors to everyone, you know, as well. And it's not being snobbish. It's actually <clears throat> being very open and yeah. and kind of what the whole thing with punk about being uh, intimate with the audience uh, is all about anyways. I will consider it my gift to the world. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time. Is John here with the microphones, or is someone here? With, you got microphones. Okay, who has a Ooh. question? Down here, this lady right here. Uh, microphones, microphones coming down. Linda. What? <laughs> or shout. <laughs> Hi guys. Uh, first of all, Pete, uh, thanks for telling me that all you wanted was for me to, to um, or us to actually leave the audience. I wouldn't have seen you over a hundred times if I'd realised that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, you said right at the very beginning you wanted um, really uh, just, you, you didn't want people to like you. So how do you feel about Buzzcocks being used for McDonald's advert? Um, no, well, uh, we knew this one come. Yeah, well. <laughs> Rather than disappoint. Uh, I've, uh, I've not seen it myself. But, um, yeah, you think it's sad? But so you'd rather Phil Collins got. <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather I can see it come in the air tonight. Well, I, I, I mean, I have no idea. I mean, it's it's one of those things. I mean, if uh, if Joel I can do butter and if he can sell it, sure. <laughs> yes. Then I think just having a little tune and. Uh, no one's doing me. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> and of course. Oh, uh, oh yes. yes. The B side is chorus. <laughs> no, that's not loud enough. What's the B side? Very good. Well, because it's just it's just meat. But then of course bo boredom was used for for Sainsbury's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Philosophical statement. It's the nature of the world we live in that the people who actually make these <laughs> decisions are actually Buscot's fans. <laughs> <laughs> that's in, yeah. Actually, that's a good point. That. You can see it in things like um, headlines in, you know, paper of choice, The Guardian, when people put up song yeah. lyrics or references song lyrics as the headline. Mm. And you think, they're the, they're our generation like Chris who've, <laughs> <laughs> who, who've infiltrated, not necessarily to the good of it. Well, I think about after 40 years, <laughs> Be really bad if people are hand done. <laughs> 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 All right, question. <laughs> Next question, L lady right back there, right by the cameras. Good exercise. <laughs> Hi, it's Jill Fermanovsky here. Oh, Hi. Way. Oh. I've come all the way from North London to Respect. see you. <laughs> Um, please clear for me, where does fiction romance come from? Ah, oh, here we go. <laughs> well, it's not as Alan Edwards has said. <laughs> um, there already was a song, Fiction Romance. And then we went into a library and it said Fiction Romance. And he said, oh, take a photo here. So that's my recollection of it. Is that yours? Is that? Yeah. Uh, it, because it was because Jill didn't mention the it. library near well, the Electric Circus in Collyhurst. Yes. And uh, I it's, think that's right. Is both, it still both, there? both Jill and Kevin Cummins yeah. were there. I think Jill, you took colour and Kevin took black and white. And it was position them by. God, it's a library story. There's one of my library colleagues over there. <laughs> um, they, they were actually marked yes. fiction. And romance, but the song was there before the photo, obviously. <laughs> I, I put one note into that song. You went, I got a song, du, 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 and I went, du, du. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sometimes how we work as a combination. <laughs> but without that one note, it's no fucking song. 
It's like minimalism in here, Brian, you know, and everything. It's fucking <laughs> trout rock in it, yeah. Peter. <laughs> The thing, it was just go... Duh, 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 no, duh, duh, take that no away, it's duh, half a song. That's it. That's my recollection. But I've got to tell them that, and they might be interesting. <laughs> Bob and the Marky. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? That. Manchester Library in the autumn. Oh, there you yay. go. Back in the library. Anarchy of the Library. Manchester Library. The new Central Library. Fantastic <laughs> building. Shame they closed most of these smaller local libraries in <laughs> Manchester. Hi, how's it going? Great. Good. <laughs> uh, what's, Pete and uh, Steve, what's the Buzzcock song you've written that you're personally most proud of? Um, well, at the moment, uh, the moment you say you don't love me, I enjoy playing that live. Um, but I mean, I mean, they're all good else. We just <laughs> forget about them and do something else. Is there anything you've written you think's been particularly underrated, like a classic you think no one's Oh, noticed? all things, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, on your look, all the you... latest stuff is just. <laughs> When you had the spotlight on punk and suddenly you're still around after it's all, you know... It, it, after the punk rock wars became the 80s and George Michael and all these mm. people and stuff. Well, George, all right, but, I mean, mm. you, know, you know, all that kind of stuff. So what, and then what, suddenly, how, by the end, it came back, you know. How, how did you think... How did you, after the... I wrote City City sometimes about the disappearance of our towns and how we are and how we relate to it. I also wrote a song called People Are Strange Machines, which... You couldn't have wrote back in the day because nobody had machines, really. But, um, that's you know, rather strange. Well, you know, right, <laughs> it's rather strange. But that's, that's things that fucking rock live and it's important to me now, you know. Is that, that you couldn't have done that at the time. And that's the significance of moving on with it, you know. And just, just but, one more. You know, um, if you want to know what songs I've written for that. I'll, what I'll, we do now, we just done in America, you know. Thank you. And just one more thing. How, after the uh, end of... Never look back. I'm looking forward. <laughs> stop stop don't plugging stop yourself. Spotting, He's trying to talk. I, I don't myself. mind. If I write songs, I go around the fucking world. Don't give me all that shit. <laughs> I'm hardcore from Manchester. He's from Leicester somewhere. Follow. <laughs> Leeds. Sorry, you know, but... This the is what punk rock's about. Talking, this right? is what I do to think. Yeah, yeah. This That's why I, the I do. Talking. I'm sensitive. He was told, but you fucking talked over him. All right, sorry, sir. Let's get back over you because he was Come finishing on. off his question. A bit of punk roll. Let's have it. <laughs> no, no, I got all night. Um, did, did, <laughs> I love him, man. Keep going. <laughs> off, but it briefly, goes. just briefly. <laughs> um, Often goes on all night. How yeah. did you, at the end of uh, punk and when you split up the first time? How did you feel about the music scene after that? Did you find the early eighties or eighties music scene uh, interesting or? No, I invented dance music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you invented house, didn't you? Kevin yeah. Saunderson said yeah, yeah. that, didn't yeah. he? <laughs> yeah, that's what started him off. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else have a question down here? Oh, here we go. Have a go. That's what it's all about. <laughs> How do you guys feel about listening to your own music? Do you enjoy it or do you avoid it? Um, well, I mean, I mean, we're normally playing it, um, so which is a whole different night, relationship it? to it. What about putting a record on? Would you put your own record on? Uh, sometimes when, I mean, perhaps once a year. <laughs> I mean, it's not really a, a... I mean, I don't tend to listen to music. In fact, the reason I make it is because I don't like listening to music. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds perverse, but that's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> so I'm just coming off the back of uh, Stoke Newington Literary Festival, which had a punk dot London strand. And it's quite interesting, a couple of the panels I put together, usually it's the author's events. It's like, where do <coughs> you get your ideas from? But the music ev musical events, whether musical writers or writers about music or whether they're musician is what are you listening to now? So I'm going to do that. What are you <laughs> listening to now? I'm listening to now. <laughs> <laughs> mm, you can, 
You can, you can, you can lie. Um, well, I did listen to the uh, New Iggy Pop album, but I didn't really like it. I heard that on the plane as well. <laughs> I heard okay. that on the plane. That's a myth. For Riggies, what are you listening to now? I'm listening, no, okay, to, I'm right. listening to myself saying society's wrong or the music's wrong. I'm listening to Silence going like, yeah, don't listen. has got a new album out. Don't I know, he's yeah, got, got a new, new album, album called In a Space Time. Crab Sunday. But yeah. what, oh. apart from, apart from yourself, yeah. what, what have you heard recently that you like? I, I listen to the ambience of people in pubs in the streets. I walk the streets alone <laughs> every day. But right. I got a new album called Inner Space Times. Ralph and I need, um, I, I'm, I'm looking now for NDNA and, and, and things like that to make the cover, because it's like, everybody's looking at, punk was outward, mm. but in the year of punk, I'm going inward, you know? Well, I'm, gonna I'm going the opposite, you know? Right. Well, what gonna, are you listening to? Richard? I'm going to take that as John <laughs> Cage's 433. 433, I was going to say that too. What am I listening <laughs> yeah. to? Um, I keep going back to Bob Dylan. He's a man after my was own Bob heart. Bob Dylan, one of the original punks in a strange yeah, way. Bob Dylan was the original was punk. Yeah. punk. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that 40 years ago, you two played in the Lesser Free Trade yeah. Hall in Manchester. <laughs> Ten years previously, Dylan played at the Free Trade Hall and something happened. Does anyone know what that was? Judas! Judas. Yeah. Can we all do that again on three? One, two, three. <laughs> Judas! <laughs> But I keep coming back to him, otherwise I listen to, like, um... I was listening to my forgotten album. Pike? Sky Yen. Uh, no, not, not Sky Yen. Cinema That's Musical well World all. episode. Yes, I want a this copy. Is gonna, this is going to oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Limited edition, <laughs> 500 vinyl, 500 <laughs> CD. Sleeve Notes by John Savage. Yeah, he's Artwork by Malcolm everybody, Garrett. Everybody's <laughs> rocking their fucking product. It's fantastic. <laughs> Otherwise, I really like Pie Corner Audio. Who's this? Who? Uh, Pie Corner Audio. He's a little Australian guy. He's kind of minimalist <laughs> techno. And when you listen to him, all of Philip Glass, mm. oh, yeah. all of Steve, Steve Reich is there. Right. There you go. So I finished. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. But I didn't like about him in, 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 in the beginning of Punk. Look, we Richard loved Bob Dylan, and that was I the beginning. I still love Bob yeah, Dylan. I do. So I and that's it. But We've got a ma <laughs> No, he's got a loud voice. <laughs> Can we just do the last question? Right. The guy being uh, a very quick one. How many of the panel have had a beer named after them? Oh, God. <laughs> have you been to the Stoke <laughs> Newington Literary Festival? No, I, I saw it, Richard. <laughs> right. <laughs> I yes. Don't know. It's not yeah. it do oh, God. Finish, Bam, you know, here State Needs and Literary Festival, Rebellion Brewery and Indy make a brew just for uh, the entertainment and refreshment tent outside the gigs. And there's a public. Oh, no one's selling beer now, are we? Um, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain. I'm trying to explain. I am trying to explain why this beer, man right? asked this <laughs> question. <laughs> That well, basically, <laughs> it goes online as a name. Stop this the beer, let's go and meet some gentlemen over there. Oh, I think, I think someone actually has a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> no. What, one second, let me just let's get this. I've been shot down <laughs> by a guitarist. Sing a song, right, and a poet, not a fucking I left Stoke Newington years ago. <laughs> what happened to Garth? I'm not even a guitarist, I've got to play. He's asking the question. What happened to Garth? Sorry, what happened to Garth? He's, uh, he's, an, he, he's got a band up in... He's, in, he's got uh, one. Tilsley. A Billy thing, hasn't he? Yeah. Hmm? Um, uh, Forever Young, I think. <laughs> yeah. If you search on the internet. Was it fun playing with him? Uh, yeah, well, I went to school with him, and <laughs> so I knew him very well. He was a character. <laughs> the Clash Thank loved you. and feared him. He was carried out of many buildings, the Vortex, and a, a, a place in Leicester in a hotel. Carried by, in them early days when he was dangerous in the punk rock days, people jumped out and all Carried out of hotels and everything Garth was. And Joe Summer loved that, you know. He was more punk than, that, than we were in that physical way, you know. <laughs> that wasn't this our department, really. Yeah, because we were winning. Team lump, lumping them. <laughs> but you speak for yourself. You know. No, one but I'm saying yes. the golf got cut out. I think we have time for two more questions. Yeah, you and you, and then I think that's it. Mm -hmm. 
keeping it simple. Now, when I started playing, I think it was autonomy. When I started mm. playing the guitar, I remember mean, thinking... This isn't a weird kid. It was in F-sharp. Nah, I, I was thinking about this. F-sharp. When I was, I was the, the, and then years like I could never get round to doing the it. Thing that, the yeah, thing that Martin Russian used to do, he, <laughs> when he used to go in to cut an album or a single, yeah. he would very speed it so it sounded right to him and exciting. Yeah. Which, as you well, rightfully point out, if you try and play along, Everything's in E. Basically. But a wonderful thing. <laughs> of, oh, I played along to the when the live electric circus thing came out, and it, they're all tuned up. To, unless that was sped up as well. I, don't uh, know. I think he oh, actually no. was involved in the mass. Oh, so you never tuned it. You never played live. <laughs> there was a lot of, you lot of speed live, in those days, more than the machines. But the interesting thing about that song was like I, mean, I was kind of thinking, looking for something different. And one day, you know, I'd done the music with Fast Cars and Promises, which are linear, you know, and I just wave my hand down the, the whole fretboard, <laughs> which is the most obvious, simplest thing in the world, yeah. but it hit the right things on the way, you know. Possibly Musically, that was true. kind of yeah. interesting. You know? <laughs> and that was, you know, it's like the most ridiculous thing, just go down the whole neck, really, but catch the right ones, you know. And you can only do that when you're young. Once you it, know it was play. very difficult. It was it like was... wave a wand and do that, you know. It was very difficult For a musician, we you know. <laughs> the first two album uh, to the Another uh, Bites tour, it was very difficult because I had to uh, process all the tracks <laughs> in order so that they were in the right key, so that if you were playing along at home. It was, a, it was really annoying yeah. to work out. Once I tuned them up, after it crossed loads of strings, it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, that's Martin's thing, and he can't speak ill of the dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he shouldn't. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, can. some of them speed up, but he tightened up the music right and all that. It's a we have one last Hello. question here. Hi, hi, it's me now. Um, <laughs> Pete, is it true that you once played a, a gig in Leeds in a Man United shirt? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. In my own mind, I didn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was, uh, uh, I was sharing a, uh, a bedroom with my brother at the time, and. <laughs> I thought, what shall I wear today for this gig? And he had a shirt which was red with a white collar. And I just thought, right, I shall wear that. Uh, I've never been to a football match in my life, so, so um, I, I had no idea that this would cause such a commotion. <laughs> <laughs> and, one, and one quick other question. Um, I did you... tell him it's a Manchester United fan. That's a red rag to a bull in Leeds at the time. Yeah, yeah. He didn't but, understand I mean, that. But, but, uh, there's the other men's talent, there's other shirt. worlds. <laughs> we didn't have he thought it was a red shirt. We didn't, I mean, it was a red shirt with a white collar. One <laughs> last it, quick it uh, question. It created the most beautiful bootleg. I think we played three songs. There was a lot of trouble and, you know, confusion there. <laughs> red sails on the side. We had a car <laughs> smash. <laughs> I mean, when I was in the middle of days of misunderstanding and punk. And mm -hmm. And, and what are your memories of? Uh, what are your memories of? Uh, you had a, a fanzine as well, which um, I think when you chose to leave the band, you uh, you wrote quite an emotive piece explaining why you were leaving the band. You, what are your memories of that? Uh, none. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> right, and here's Bob Dylan at the uh, free trade <laughs> hall <laughs> filming his video See, for. And it says. Subterranean homesick blues. Slaughter the dogs. But, uh, dogs, but buscocks. Which was, <laughs> which was great drummer's John Mars' input to that poster. Well, I want to thank you guys for tonight. And uh, one pound. <laughs> <laughs> Cheap date. Just before we go, I just want to thank you, Richard. I want to thank you, Steve, Pete, for joining us tonight. Uh, there is a punk exhibition going on at the library. There's other events happening uh, throughout the month here. You can pick up one of these flyers on your way out. Uh, the guys will be going out, and they would... Are you guys agreed to do a bit of signing as well? Yes, yes, yes. yes. The bar is open. So um, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you all for listening. The bar's open. <laughs>